Hey, today we're going to be studying in the book of Judges again, and we're going to be looking at chapters 6, 7, and 8, and we're going to be studying about Gideon. The title of the lesson is, Go in the Strength You Have. For those that have not been with us in our previous studies, a few things to consider. The time of the judges takes place immediately following the death of Joshua and the conquering of the promised land. The entire theme of the book of Judges is summed up in the very, very, very last verse of the book itself, Judges 21, 25. In those days there was no king in Israel. Everyone did as he saw fit. Another glimpse of those days comes from 1 Samuel chapter 3, verse 1. In those days the word of the Lord was rare, and there were not many visions. Those days are just like these days. Amen, church? I mean, it's sad where things are at in God's church universal. We find in the book of Judges a very distinct pattern. We find that the people of God, when they begin to disobey, that leads them into the darkness, that leads them to have great distress, that causes them to go to the divine, that's God, amen, and then God saves them through a deliverer, as we find out today, when the deliverer dies, then the people of God go back to disobedience. So we see this cycle throughout the book of Judges. As a matter of fact, you'll find it throughout the entire Bible. Disobedience, darkness, distress, the divine, the deliverer, death, and then the cycle begins again. Let's get to chapter 6. I like the way chapter 6, verse 1 starts out. Again, <laughs> again, the Israelites did evil in the eyes of the Lord. And for seven years, he gave them into the hands of the Midianites. Because the power of Midian was so oppressive, the Israelites prepared shelters for themselves of mountain clefts, caves, and strongholds. Whenever the Israelites planted their crops, the Midianites, the Amalekites, and other eastern peoples invaded the country. They camped on the land and ruined the crops all the way to Gaza and didn't spare a living thing for Israel, neither sheep, nor cattle, nor donkey. They came up with their livestock and their tents like swarms of locusts. It was impossible to count the men and their camels. They invaded the land of ravage it. Midian so impoverished the Israelites, they cried out to the Lord for help. When the Israelites cried to the Lord because of Midian, he sent them a prophet who said, This is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says. I brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. I snatched you from the power of Egypt and from the hand of all your oppressors. I drove them before you and gave you the land. I said to you, I am the Lord your God. Do not worship the God of the Amorites in whose land you live, but you have. Not listen to me. And so the pattern is clear right here. We see that again the Israelites did evil in the eyes of the Lord. There's disobedience. The Bible says right here that God gives them into the hands of the Midianites. There is darkness that comes upon them. They're, they're in fear of their lives. The whole land has been ravaged. Now, it's kind of interesting if we remember back into the history of God's word, particularly in the book of Numbers, we remember that Moses, when he first fled Egypt, went to the land of Midian, and there he found his wife, Sephora. As a matter of fact, Sephora's dad, Jethro, became his top advisor. We talked about two weeks ago in our study of Deborah that Hobab, the son of Jethro, or the brother of Sephora, was asked by Moses to go along with God's people. And he took that part of the Midianites, and they became known as the Kenites. And they came in with the Israelites, and they were saved. They came into the Promised Land. And, of course, we read about the most famous of the Kenites, Jael, who uh, gave it to Sisera. You remember that? And yet there's some lessons that we learn right here. Hobab takes that little part of the Midianites, and he saves them by a decision. But we find that by Numbers chapter 22, the Moabites and the Midianites have become 
allies. By Numbers chapter 25, the Moabites and the Midianites have now pulled the Israelites into immorality and idolatry. Remember when Phineas had to take a stance? At the end of Moses' leadership in Numbers 31, we find that God says, listen, before you die, decimate, destroy the Midianites. Well, we find that some of them were not destroyed. Some have suggested, and I believe it's true, that the reason that the Midianites were not totally destroyed is sentimentality. I mean, after all, Moses himself married a Midianite. They were part of the Midianites that were with the people of God, the Israelites. But they weren't hard line in their obedience to the word of God. And in time, they drifted. Sentimentality comes. The Midianites in time raised on up to be even more powerful than the Israelites because the hand of God was against the Israelites. Are you with me right here? How often has sentimentality stopped us from obeying the word of God completely? When it comes to family members, when it comes to close friends, are you willing to lay it all on the line and say, yes, I will follow the Lord my God at all costs? Now right here it's interesting. The Bible says that in verse 6, Midian so impoverished the Israelites that they cried out to the Lord for help. They prayed. They prayed. This was purposeful by God. Have you had distress in your life? See, distress is God trying to get your attention. That's what distress is. Distress can come in many forms. There can be financial distress, marriage distress, relationship distress, living situation distress, and then one of the, the most challenging, health issues. Health issues. But we find that when the Israelites cried out to God, they were humbled by their distress, and they cried out, God, please save us, then God sends a prophet. And his message was simple. He said, listen, God did all the great miracles in taking you out of the land of Egypt and out of slavery and delivered you to this land, and yet when you got here, you did not listen. Kind of like, I told you so. I told you so. Well, you know, this, this past week I, I had the opportunity to, to jump into a restoration study with a gentleman. And this guy was a disciple, just totally beaten up by life. I mean, married in the kingdom, but divorce came upon him. He's had financial duress. And in all of these things, the hand of God has been against them. And I, I just asked him, I said, hey, how bad did it get? He says, you know, it got so bad, I told God I didn't want to live anymore. And then I cursed him. I cursed him. Now, it's kind of interesting. Also in that study was Lujak. And I appreciate you know, Lujak lives a totally transparent life. You know what's going on. That's how you know who's a true disciple. He responded. He says, you know something? I can totally relate to that. When I got in great distress and the hand of God was against me, I cursed God. And I hadn't really seen until this very moment how far away I'd gotten from God. See, if you're not in people's lives, if you're not in studies, if you're not helping trying to get people restored, if you're not helping trying to keep people baptized, you are going to drift and you won't even see how bad your life has gotten. Are you with me right here? But you need to mark this. Distress is when the hand of God is against you. And it's all in love because he's simply trying to get your attention. Verse 11. The angel of the Lord came and sat down under the oak of Ophrah that belonged to Joash the Abbotite, where his son Gideon was threshing the wheat in a wine press to keep it from the Midianites. He had to hide the wheat from the Midianites because they were getting everything. When the angel of the Lord appeared to Gideon, he said, The Lord is with you, mighty warrior. But Sir Gideon replied, If the Lord is with us, why has all this happened to us? Where are all the miracles that our fathers told us about when they said, Did not the Lord bring us up out of Egypt? 
But now the Lord has abandoned us and put us into the hand of Midian. The Lord turned to him and said, Go in the strength you have and save Israel out of Midian's hand. Am I not sending you? But Lord Gideon asked, How can I save Israel? My clan is the weakest in Manasseh, and I'm the least in my family. The Lord answered, I will be with you, and you will strike down all the Midianites together. Is that a cranking passage right there? You know, I, I love this passage. And I don't know, it, it, it seems kind of cool. The angel of the Lord comes down and sits underneath the tree. <laughs> He's just waiting for the right time. Isn't that the Lord? He just waits for the right time time to come into your life now we understand that not all angels appear to us some remain invisible in this particular case the angel appeared to Gideon and he goes on over to him and he says the Lord is with you my warrior Gideon turns around what's he talking about and then he says but sir if the Lord's with us why has all this happened to us have you ever asked that question Where are all the miracles that we read about in the Bible? That we read about that were 5, 10, 20 years ago. Where are all the miracles? I mean, when they had 850 baptisms the first year in planting the Moscow church. Where are all the miracles? Where are the miracles? When the wall of apartheid fell, when we sent in a team of African American and white brothers and sisters to be able to build one church in Johannesburg. Where are the miracles? When we sent a church into Hong Kong ten years before, Hong Kong was deeded back to the Red Chinese. Where are those miracles? That's, that's what Gideon was answered. And then his conclusion was, but now the Lord has abandoned us and put us into the hand of Midian. Well, now, he was half right. God did put him into the hand of Midian. But it wasn't God who abandoned them. <laughs> It was they that abandoned God. But see, God was still working. See, a lot of times when we don't see miracles, we don't think God's working. Let me tell you something. The Lord was working on Israel right here. And he was causing great distress. But look what he says right here. Verse 14. The Lord turned to Gideon and said, Go in the strength you have and save Israel out of Gideon's hand. Am I not sending you? You know, that is, that is the most awesome command, I think, in all the book of Judges. Go in the strength you have. There's not one of us that can't do that. Some of us have a lot of strength. Some of us have medium strength. Some of us have very little strength. Some of us got mustard seed strength. Some of us got half mustard seed strength. But the Bible says, go in the strength you have, and God will make up the difference. Is that incredible? Just go. See, the problem is we don't obey. We just stay in the strength we have. And we don't pursue our God or the dreams that he has for us. You know, he says right here, but Lord, verse 15, Gideon asks, how can I save Israel? My clan's the weakest in Manasseh, and I'm the least of my family. It sounds so humble at first, doesn't it? Oh, my, 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 my clan's the weakest in all Manasseh. Like, we're like dirt in Manasseh, and, and I'm, I'm the worst of the dirt. Don't compute, confuse self-pity with humility. Wow. That, bro. See, a lot of times we see people that are willing to step out and we go, they're arrogant. No. They're trying to obey God to go in the strength they have. Notice the Lord's response to Gideon. I will be with you and you will strike down all the Midianites together. Amen? Amen? You see, weakness is very important. Because weakness makes us depend on God and have compassion for others that are weak. Gideon would understand this. Because we're going to find that Gideon's not this supercharged, dynamic leader. He's a guy that doubts himself again and again and again. Can you relate to that a little bit right there? That's our friend Gideon. But look at this, verse 17, I love it. He starts to get some faith. Gideon replied, If now I have found favor in your eyes, give me a sign that it's really you talking to me. 
please do not go away until I come back and bring my offering and set it before you. Do, you. do you get a sense of hope in him right now? See, that's our first point. The favor of God. Even though he and all of his people are in great distress, now because the angels brought him a message that God will be with him, and then if he goes to the strengths he had, he will incur the favor of God. But once more, his faith wasn't quite ready to do it. Let's keep reading. And the Lord said, I'll wait until you return. Gideon went in, prepared a young goat, and from an ephah of flour he made bread without yeast, putting the meat in a basket and its broth in a pot. He brought it out and offered them to him under the oak. The angel of God said to him, Take the meat and the unleavened bread and place them on this rock and pour out the broth. And Gideon did so. With the tip of the staff that was in his hand, the angel of the Lord touched the meat and the unleavened bread. Fire flared from the rock, consuming the meat and the bread, and the angel of the Lord disappeared. When Gideon realized that it was the angel of the Lord, he exclaimed, Ha ha ha. Sovereign Lord, I have seen the angel of the Lord face to face, but the Lord said to him, Peace, do not be afraid, you're not going to die. That was an awesome message right there. <laughs> so Gideon built an altar to the Lord there and called it, The Lord is Peace. To this day it stands in Orphra of the Abedrites. That same night the Lord said to him, Take the second bull from your father's earth, the one seven years old. Tear down your father's altar to Baal and cut down the astro pole beside it. Then build a proper kind of altar to the Lord your God on the top of his height. Using the wood of the astro pole so that you cut it down, offer the second bull as a burnt offering. Now, this is kind of interesting right here. We find that God now gives him a specific command. He says, I want you to tear down the altar of Baal and the astro pole. Now, it's kind of interesting. I, I, I got with uh, Marty and Kathy Wooten yesterday for, for detime. time now I was sharing about this passage, and Marty gave me an, an incredible insight into really the mindset of the Israelites at that time. We all know that the Israelites were monotheistic. They worshipped one God. Amen, guys? But not in the way we think. Now, most of us think there's one God, and there's only one God. Their mindset was quite different. They believed in the one God of Israel, but they also believed that every nation had their own God, be it Molech or Chemosh or, or whoever. They just believed that Jehovah was a more cranking God than the other ones. But when they didn't see Jehovah cranking in their mind, then they quickly and easily prostituted themselves to other gods. And so right here we see the Israelites, they're worshiping Baal with the altar, and they have an astropole that, I mean, crude as it sounds, is, is fashioned like the male sex organ. And he says, listen, this is despicable in the nation of Israel. My God told me to tear it down. So let's see what happens. Verse 27. So Gideon took ten of his servants and did as the Lord told him. But because he was afraid of his family and the men of the town, he did at night rather than in the daytime. Well, the Lord wasn't specific, was he? <laughs> but we're getting a little bit inside into Gideon here, aren't we? Let's keep going. In the morning, when the men of the town got up, there was Baal's altar demolished, and the astro pole beside it cut down, and the second bull sacrificed on the newly built altar. They asked each other, who did this? When they carefully investigated, they were told, Gideon, son of Joash, did it. The man of the town demanded of Joash, bring out your son. He must die because he's broken down Baal's altar and cut down the astro pole beside it. But Joash replied to the hostile crowd around him, are you going to plead Baal's cause? Are you trying to save him? Whoever fights for him shall be put to death by the morning. But if Baal really is a god, he can defend himself when someone breaks down his altar. So that day, they called Gideon Jeroboam, saying, Let Baal contend with him, because he broke down Baal's altar. This is cranking right here. That night, Gideon gets ten of his servants, and they cut down the Asherah pole. They tear down the altar. They build a new altar to the Lord. They use the wood of the Asherah pole to be part of the burning flames for the Lord. And then when the, everybody got up in the day, they go, what the heck happened here? And they just investigate, and they found out it was Gideon. And so they go to Gideon's dad, Joash. He says, give us your son. He deserves to die. He has torn down the altar of Baal. And then Joash, he says, listen, anybody that wants to defend Baal, he's going to die by my hand. 
It's kind of interesting. When somebody takes a stand, do you notice that other people start taking the stands? Yeah. See, it took, it took Gideon to take a stand. And then when Gideon was being attacked, his dad goes, hold on here just a moment. If Baal's a god, he could defend himself. Everybody goes, you know, he's got a point right there. <laughs> and so that day, they gave Gideon a new name. Jeho Baal, which means let Baal contend. He says, well, if Baal's so great, let him contend with this guy, Gideon. And that became his nickname. And so not only did Gideon win over his dad, but because of his dad's influence and his conviction says, listen, anybody touches a hair of my son for the cause of Baal will die. Moved a lot of hearts. And everybody started to get convictions. You know, uh, when I think about convictions rising, I, I, I think about uh, Lou Jack. You know, he became a disciple at Harvard University. Wow. That's incredible. People go to Harvard, have almost everything except the Lord. And he recognized that. He had a passion for his family, and so that's why he was on the L.A. mission team. Amazingly, over the next several years, Lou Jack was able to influence all the members of his immediate family to become disciples. His mom, his two sisters, his little big brother. <laughs> and then, just a couple of years ago, Big Lou, his dad. But it took one guy getting convictions, not giving in to sentimentality, and saying, this is what the Lord teaches. On, Are you with me right here, guys? Yeah. See, a lot of us want to convert our family, but we don't want to pay the price that Lujak paid. See, we want to be, always be loved by our family and have all the fuzzy-wuzzy little things happening. You'll never convert your family until you take the stand of Jesus who took a stand with his family and then converted his mom and all of his brothers. That's pretty cranky. Amen, guys? You've got to be holy for the Lord. But when you take a stand for God, others are going to take a stand. And just like Joash, they will have influence on still others. You know, I also think about Lou Jack taking a stand. Here in this day of our new movement, I mean, it, it's incredible. I remember the very first time Louise and Kathy came to church. I mean, it was just, it was awesome. Uh, Kathy is like a daughter to us, and Louise has become like a son to us. And as we got in there, it was, it was quite evident that, that, that God had sent them into distress. Or as, as we would say, they had a marriage fight Saturday night. <laughs> and, and, and Kathy was, in particular, was really hurting. You know how the sisters are a little bit more in touch than us guys? And she says, listen, I'm, I'm, I'm dying. I'm dying spiritually. Louise, for my birthday, please take me to Kip and Elena's church. And she came here with hope. It was pretty awesome. They quickly rolled up their sleeves and said, man, we've got to, there's so many people like us that need help. And they've been there helping so many people. And just with Louise's convictions and Kathy's convictions, I mean, it's amazing to see other people taking a stand. I mean, it's amazing, the two couples from Bakersfield taking their stand. Amen, guys? And now we have a Bible talk up in Bakersfield. I mean, it's, it's, it's awesome to see Samir and Lordy taking a stand clear out in Palm Springs, and now we have a Bible talk in Palm Springs. I mean, it's awesome. They've got a Bible talk in Whittier, and very excitingly, soon to be, there's going to be a Bible talk in Rancho Cucamonga where Kathy's mom and dad live. You see, when someone takes a stand, you've got to make a decision about it. And if someone loves the Lord, they're eventually going to turn themselves in. Amen? You see, that's what happens when you have the favor of the Lord. All you need to do is go in the strength you have. Amen? Let's keep reading. Verse 33. Now all the Midianites, Amalekites, and other eastern peoples joined forces and crossed over the Jordan and camped in the valley of Jezreel. Remember, we were in the valley of Jezreel just two weeks ago in talking about Deborah and the battle there. Verse 34. 
Then the Spirit of the Lord came upon Gideon, and he blew a trumpet, summoning the Abrazites to follow him. He sent messages throughout Manasseh, calling them to arms, and also into Asher, Zebulun, Naphtali, so that they too went up to meet him. Gideon said to the Lord, If you will save Israel by my hand as you have promised, look, I will place a wool fleece on the threshing floor. If there's dew only on the fleece and all the ground is dry, then I will know that you will save Israel by my hand as you said. And that's what happened. Gideon rose early the next day. He squeezed the fleece and wrung out the dew, a bowl full of water. You see, he still needed a sign. His faith was still weak. Now look at this. Then Gideon said to God, Do not be angry with me. Let me make just one more request. Allow me one more test with the fleece. This time make the fleece dry and the ground covered with dew. That night God did so. Only the fleece was dry and all the ground was covered with dew. Isn't it amazing the patience of our God? Man, if a guy like Gideon can make it, we can make it. We can make it. You know, I really believe in the concept here of what's called a fleece, laying out a fleece. Of course, taken from the, the, the sheep fleece. And for Elena and myself, it became clear to us that with all the things that were happening in our former fellowship, it was time to start a new movement. Steve and Lisa Johnson, former World Sector leaders, had come to join us in Portland, and, and we knew that Steve and Lisa could more than take over Portland, and, and they have gifts we don't have, and they could take Portland higher. But we realized that, that we need to go to a major city, and it seemed clear that the choice would be between New York and Los Angeles. And so, last fall, Elena and I laid out a fleece. We said, wherever the remnant group comes out, wherever there's a group of brothers and sisters that say, we want to take a stand for God and world evangelism, that'll be the sign of where Elena and I will go and start a new church. Well, I kind of thought it would be New York for various reasons. But to my surprise, because of men like Ron Harding and Raul Sanchez and Sal Velasco... The remnant came out here. I go, whoa, baby, we're going back to Los Angeles. And, and you know, when you, when you lay out that fleece, then you must be obedient to it. I mean, it's, it's, it's really been amazing. The mission team we brought down from Portland had 42 disciples on it. We just started the church here May 6th. And excitingly, already we've seen 17 people baptized, 29 people restored. These were fallaway people. And we've seen about 35 people place membership, all in less than three months. That is the hand of God. Are you with me right here? You see, when you have the favor of God, and you go, you don't just sit around, but you go in the strength you have, God is going to bless you. Are you with me here, church? Let's go to chapter 7. Our second point is enjoy the odds. We're not talking about Las Vegas here. (laughs) Verse 1. Early in the morning. Now, I was thinking about making that one of my points, but I I decided not to. Early in the morning, Jeroboam, that is Gideon, and all of his men camped at the spring at Herod. Now, Herod literally means trembling, and it was retroactively named. You'll see why in just a moment. The camp of Midian was north of them in the valley near the hill of Moriah. Well, now... Midian's camp, we know from chapter 8, verse 10, had 135,000 troops. 135,000 troops. Verse 2. The Lord said to Gideon, You have too many men for me to deliver Midian into their hands. In order that Israel may not boast against me that her own strength has saved her, announce now to the people, anyone who trembles with fear may turn back and leave Mount Gilead. So 22,000 men left while 10,000 men remain. <laughs> See, that's where the, 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 the spring gets its name, the trembling. They're at the fountain of Horn. Well, we see right here that when Gideon called out, and you remember in chapter 6, in verses 34 and 35, he calls out not only his family, the Abrazites, but he also calls out all the tribe of Manasseh, Asher, Zebulun, and Naphtali, 32,000 fighters gathered. Now, here's my feeling. I think that Gideon was disappointed by the turnout. That's one-third of all the tribes of Israel. And when the tribes entered the Promised Land, there were over 600,000 fighting men. So when 32,000 guys show up, I think he gets kind of that pit. Yep, you ever get 
that pit down here? When, you know, oh, man. It's like when nobody comes to Bible talk. You know what I'm talking about? <laughs> and he had 32,000 guys, but the Midianites had 135,000 guys. And God comes to him and says, dude, way too many guys. What, 32,000, way too many. We got we to gotta trim this back. Uh, just tell anybody who's scared, anybody that's afraid, doesn't want to go into battle, they can turn back. Can you imagine he makes that announcement and 22,000 guys just walk away? <laughs> You're one of the 10,000? Boy. <laughs> Read on. Verse 4. But the Lord said to Gideon, there's still too many men. Take them down to the water and I'll sift them there for you. If I say this one shall go with you, he shall go. But if I say this one shall not go with you, he shall not go. So Gideon took the men down to the water. There the Lord told him, separate those who lap the water with their tongues like a dog from those who kneel down to drink. 300 men lapped their, with their hands to the mouths. All the rest got down with their knees to drink. The Lord said to Gideon, with the 300 men that lapped, I will save you and give the Midianites into your hands. Let all the other men go, each to his own place. So he makes another announcement to the 10,000 guys. He says, okay, guys, go take a little fellowship break right here. Everybody just go get some water. So all the guys go tell, oh, man, it's really hot, you know. And they go on down, and most of the guys just kind of go down to the water and just, you know, lap up the water like a dog. But 300 of the guys, they kneel down carefully. They get the water with the cup of their hand, and they're watchful, as soldiers should always be. You see, the test of God to get Gideon the right number of people, 300, was very simple. It was a test of heart and of character. Number one was the heart. You cannot fear doing the work of God. And number two was the character. You have to be ready for spiritual battle. Amen? Well, you know, it's kind of interesting. I, I did some computation about the odds. At 32,000 to 135,000, the odds there are four to one. And God tells Gideon, hey, that's, those are ridiculous. If you win that battle, you might think that you did it. And I want it clear it was all about me. So then they trimmed down to the 10,000. Well, now the odds are 14 to 1. God goes, Gideon, way, way too many people. It's just not going to be real clear. Gets down to 300 where the odds are 450 to 1. God goes, now that's the kind of odds I enjoy. This, it's it's going to be obvious. This is all about me and not about you, Gideon. It's going to be all about me. Well, let's read on right here. Middle of verse 8. Now the camp of Midian lay below him in the valley. During the night, the Lord said to Gideon, Get up, go down against the camp, because I'm going to give it in your hands. If you are afraid to attack, go down to the camp with your servant Pur. Now, let's think about Gideon. If he's afraid to attack, go on down and check out the camp. What do you think Gideon's going to do? Yeah, he's going to go check out the camp. <laughs> Verse 11. And listen to what they're saying. Afterwards, you will be encouraged to attack the camp. So he and Pur and his servant went down to the outpost of the camp. The Midianites and the Amalekites and all the other eastern peoples had settled in the valley thick as locusts. The camels could no more be counted than the sands on the seashore. Gideon arrived just as a man was telling his friend this dream. I had a dream, he said. A round loaf of barley bread came tumbling into the Midianite camp. It struck the tent with such force that the tent overturned and collapsed. His friend responded, This can be nothing other than the sword of Gideon, son of Joash the Israelite. God has given the Midianites and the whole camp into his hands. When Gideon heard the dream and its interpretation, he worshiped the Lord. He says, Thank you, Lord. Amen. You know, right here, it's kind of interesting. He goes down to the camp, and I believe in dreams. Just, just by chance, these two guys are talking. He says, Man, I had a dream. And this wasn't Martin Luther King right here. He says, I had a dream. He says, this round loaf of barley bread came tumbling into the Midianites. Well, the barley bread represents the Israelites. They had become the bread basket for all the Midianites. This barley bread comes tumbling into the Midianite camp. It struck the tent with such force that the tent overturned and collapsed. Reading this in English, it kind of goes biased. The Hebrew is very definitive. It doesn't say it struck a tent. It says in Hebrew it struck the tent, meaning the general's tent. So when the barley bread takes out the general's tent and it is totally collapsed and overturned, it was obvious. Gideon's going to get us. 
And Gideon goes, oh boy, now I'm ready for battle. <laughs> Let's read on. Verse 15. When Gideon heard the dream and its interpretation, he worshiped God. He returned to the camp of Israel and called out, Get up! The Lord has given the Midianite camp into your hands. Dividing the 300 men into three companies, he placed trumpets and empty jars in the hands of all of them with torches inside. Watch me, he told them. Follow my lead. When I get to the edge of the camp, do exactly as I do. Let me tell you something. Gideon believed in imitation. When I and all those who are with me blow our trumpets, then from all around the camp blow yours and shout, For the Lord and for Gideon! Wow, that wouldn't go down too good today. I mean, can't we just go for the Lord and leave out Gideon? No, that, that would leave out the plan of God. See, we talked about in that very first lesson. God has chosen to save his people when they're in distress, not by injecting himself perfectly, but by raising up leaders that can deliver and save the people. Now, in the past, we went too far and we made our leaders idols. But we've got to understand that leaders are a plan of God to save his people. And so right here we have the perfect balance. God has mentioned earth for the Lord and for Gideon. And the church said, Amen. Interesting, verse 19. Gideon and the hundred men with him reached the edge of the camp at the beginning of the middle watch just after they had changed the guard. Now let's stop right here. This is kind of interesting, the middle watch. For the Israelite nation at this time, they divided the night into three watches. 6 p.m. to 10 p.m., 10 p.m. to 2 a.m., and 2 a.m. to 6 p.m. By the time we have our New Testaments, they go on to a Roman division, which had four watches. 6 p.m. to 9, 9 to 12, 12 to 3, 3 a.m. to 6 a.m. That's why it says that Jesus walked on the water during the fourth watch of the night. That was a scary moment. <laughs> but right here we now know it's, it's late into the night. It's in the middle watch. There's the changing of the guard, and we read this. They blew their trumpets and broke the jars that were in their hand. The three companies blew the trumpets and smashed the jars. Grasping the torches in their left hands and holding their right hands the trumpets they were to blow, they shouted, A sword for the Lord and for Gideon! While each man held his position around the camp, all the Midianites ran, crying out as they fled. When the 300 trumpets sounded, the Lord caused the men throughout the camp to turn on each other with their swords. Can you imagine... They stuck around. They have the camp bordered on three sides. And all of a sudden, they're blowing the trumpet. They're shouting, a sword for the Lord and for Gideon. You see this echoing all in the middle. And these guys are just all waking up. They don't know what to do. They hear the sound of glass breaking. They go, oh, my gosh, we're doomed. And so they turn on each other. Because this wasn't one unified army. They didn't really know each other. And so they started killing each other. And all, all of Gideon's guys are just standing around on the outside. Look at this then. The army fled to Beth Shittah, towards Zerara, as far as the borders of Abel Mahola and Tabath. Israelites from uh, Naphtali, Asher, and all Manasseh were called out, and they pursued the Midianites. Gideon sent messages throughout the hill country of Ephraim, saying, Come down against the Midianites and seize the waters of Jordan ahead of them as far as Beth Barah. Now this is kind of interesting right here. Most commentators think this. Remember all the guys that were sent home? Well, they were from Naphtali, Asher, and Manasseh. All that happened right here is after the Lord said, I just want 300 guys, all these soldiers are recalled. And he says, hey, I'm going to give you a second chance to get in the battle. Is that awesome? Now look at this. So all the men of Ephraim were called out, and they took the waters of Jordan as far as Beth Barah. They also captured two of the Midianite leaders, Oreb and Sereb. They killed Oreb at the rock of Oreb and Zeb at the winepress of Zeb. They pursued the Midianites and brought the heads of Oreb and Zeb to Gideon, who was by the Jordan. So now, and this is kind of surprising, we remember at the beginning when Gideon wanted help, he did not ask the tribe of Ephraim, which is the strongest tribe. Remember, in Ephraim was Shiloh, where the, the ark was at, where the tabernacle was at, where the high priest was supposedly at. But by this time, the tribes had become so isolated in their autonomy, there was very little communication, and there certainly wasn't a unified worship of Jehovah God. And so for whatever reason, Gideon decides not to at first ask the Ephraimites to come. But then, when he saw that the armies of the Midianites were heading out in that direction, and the Ephraimites could stop them, then he does call them. Now look what happens. Chapter 8, verse 1. Now the Ephraimites asked Gideon, Why have you treated us like this? Why didn't you call us when we went to fight Midian? And they criticized him sharply. But he answered them, 
What have I accomplished compared to you? Aren't the gleaves of Ephraim's grapes better than the full grape harvest of Ebizer? God gave Oreb and Zeb, the Midianite leaders, in your hands. What was I able to do compared to you? At this, the resentment against him subsided. Now that's a humble guy. <laughs> what happened right here? And the Ephraimites were furious that they had not been asked to go battle against the Midianites. And they come to him, and they had bad attitudes towards Gideon. And Gideon just takes the most humble route. He says, well, guys, what have I accomplished compared to you? I mean, the gleanings of Ephraim's grape. Now, gleaning is like if you go pick trees, uh, pick apples off an apple tree, you pick them, and then you go back a second time to find if there are any apples left. That's the gleaning. So he says, the gleaning of Ephraim's grapes are better than all of my hometown's grapes. And then he says, God gave Orb and Zerah, the Midianite leaders, into your hands. What was I able to do compared to you? He says, you guys are just so awesome. I mean, all I did was get 300 guys and route 135,000. <laughs> but he remained humble. You know, when you think about it, life is all about beating the odds. You know, I, I had to... This past week, you know, Elaine and I have been trying to find a, a place to live. We've been living in a month-by-month -month place. And uh, things got kind of in, in, intense. We had kind of a, a bump in the middle of the week. That, that's, that's a fight, okay? <laughs> and she, she said something, and then I just got upset, and I raised my voice. And then she started crying. She said, I, I'm just so sorry. I go, oh, gosh. You know, when someone's humble, it just gets to your heart. You know what I'm talking about? And she just got to my heart. I, that's absolutely the only way we've made it 30 years in marriage. To go 30 years in marriage is to beat the odds. Now look at Denise Bordieri right out here. When Denise and Nick were first coming to the church in Portland, they were strongly considering a divorce. And in their distress, they were invited to church and they saw something. They saw hope for their marriage. They saw hope for their lives if they both give themselves to God. And, of course, in a few weeks, they are both baptized into Christ. You see, in the world, if you get married right now, the odds are you're going to get a divorce. Sadly, in our former fellowship, there are so many divorces. Why? Because the world has crept into the church. You see, if you're faithful to God, you'll be faithful to your spouse. That's the bottom line. You know, it's kind of interesting. I'm so excited about Luis and Giovanna being baptized today uh, from the Latin ministry. And I had a chance to, to be with Luis uh, yesterday at Starbucks. We were studying out baptism and just getting our convictions hard line. Yes, you got to be baptized to be saved. You have to have faith, you got to repent, but then you got to be baptized to have your sins forgiven. And it was awesome because he, he saw and he goes, wow, that's the truth. You know, have, have you ever just seen it in the Bible and go, wow, that's the truth? Well, the interesting thing, the reason that they even started studying the Bible was they were referred to Sal Velasco for marriage counseling because they were on the verge of divorce. And I told him, I said, here's the thing, Luis. The only reason to get baptized tomorrow is not to save your marriage, but because Jesus Christ died for you, and you're going to live a life of a disciple in gratefulness in return. But I promise you this. If you and your wife totally surrender to the Lord, your marriage will heal, and your marriage will beat the odds. You see, we've got to enjoy the odds. I mean, when you think about it, Christianity is all against the odds. All against the odds. It was so awesome. We had staff meeting at the house this week, and Mike Underhill was just kind of sharing and kind of laughing at himself. He says, you know, four, four months ago, my mom and dad came down to Los Angeles to save me. He says, but I was living with my girlfriend. I was a bartender. What are the odds that I would come back to Christ? What, you ever think that when you meet someone that's fallen away? You go, man, what are the odds? Or, or, or you mean even non-Christian, what are the odds? And now, four months later, Mike has not only been restored, but he is leading our teen ministry and loving it. Is that awesome? You see, God, God is all about beating the odds if you have the favor of the Lord and go in the strength you have. Let's close on out right here in chapter 8.
Our last point is, with idolatry comes spiritual amnesia. Chapter 8, verse 22. They've overcome the Midianites, and we read in verse 22. The Israelites said to Gideon, rule over us, you, your son, and your grandson, because you've saved us out of the hand of Midian. But Gideon told them, I will not rule over you, nor will my son rule over you. The Lord will rule over you. See, after this great victory, they wanted to make Gideon their king. And they said, hey, not only will you be king, but your son will be king, and your grandson will be king. That will be great. But Gideon understood what the judges, time of judges was all about. In those days, there was no king in Israel. Everyone did what was right in his own eyes. You see, the king of Israel was supposed to be God. In 1 Samuel, the people wanted a king just like all the other nations. And Gideon says, no, I will not be your king. God needs to rule over you. Is that awesome right there? Now look what happens. Verse 24. And he said, I do have one request. That each of you give me an earring from your share of the plunder. It was a custom of the Israelites to wear gold earrings. They answered, we'll be glad to give them. So they spread out a garment and each man threw a ring from his plunder into it. The weight of the gold rings he asked for came to 1,700 shekels, 43 pounds of gold. Not counting the ornaments, the pendants, and the purple garments worn by the kings of Midian or the chains that were on the camel's necks. Gideon made the gold into an ephod, which he placed in Orpah, his town. All Israel prostituted themselves by worshiping it there, and it became a snare to Gideon and his family. Wow. What happened? Well, what happened was this. He says, God has been so good. Please, please give me each of you from the plunder a gold ring, whether it be an ear ring or a nose ring. And give me the plunder. And it came to 43 pounds of gold. Now, remember, there was a total disconnect between the tribes. There was this isolated autonomy. There was no more of the worship in Shiloh. That wasn't happening in Manasseh. And even though he turned down the kingship, Gideon still saw himself to be the head of state. He was still the judge. And all through the Old Testament, the head of state always had the privilege of, and it's used over and over again, the phrase, to inquire of the Lord. And the way that they would always inquire of the Lord, they would go to the high priest who wore the ephod of Aaron. And then they would be able to discern what God's will was. Well, because there was a total disconnect, he says, well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make a gold ephod. This would be cranking a cool gold ephod to commemorate the Lord's victory in order that someday, if need be, we can discern the will of God. Sadly, that which was a good intention becomes a tradition that becomes an idol. And we find the people of God begin to drift. 28. Thus Midian was to do before the Israelites and did not raise its head again during Gideon's lifetime. The land enjoyed peace for 40 years. Verse 33. No sooner had Gideon died than the Israelites again prostituted themselves to the Baals. They set up Baal Berith as their God and did not remember the Lord their God who had rescued them from the hands of all their enemies on every side. They also failed to show kindness to the family of Jeroboam, that is Gideon, for all the good things he had done for them. And so we find the cycle complete. We find disobedience, darkness, distress, the divine, the deliverer, the death of the deliverer, and then the people immediately return to disobedience. That's how important leadership is in the plan of God. Where there is no leadership, the people will perish. You know, right here is, is, is something very sad. We find that not only had they begun to worship the idol of the ephod, but after Gideon dies, they begin to worship the idol of Baal. And they totally prostitute themselves. And in that, they even get to the point of forgetting the good that Gideon and his family had done for all Israel. Spiritual amnesia. You know, it occurs to me that as we look around, we find so many disciples have forgotten the good that God had done for them and for spiritual Israel. 
There's been a turning to idols, whether it be personal dreams, money, people, places. And there's been a forgetting of what God has done in their lives. And so bitterness reigns. Because when they see no more miracles, they start looking back with even greater bitterness to go, well, it wasn't all worth it. I wasted my life. And they get to the point of even Lou Jack saying, where they curse God. You know, I was privileged to be invited by the Martinez family to be able to go to a funeral on Thursday and Friday. And uh, kind of the matriarch of their entire clan passed away. Uh, it was Lou Jack's aunt, Aunt Tina. But really, she functioned kind of as a grandma for all of Lou Jack and his siblings. And they called her Nana. And it was just a fascinating woman. I mean, just to hear all the different stories. She, she died when she was 84 years old. She had two great, great grandchildren. And one of the great grandchildren shared. It was, it, was, it, was, it was awesome. And the thing that fascinated me watching the whole Martinez clan was there, there was such, in, in, in this time of terrible sadness, they were buoyed with such incredible joy. As, as they remembered Tina's hospitality, her cooking, her jokes, and the way she played poker. <laughs> and and it, it, was, it, was, it, was, it was incredible, the celebration of a life. And, and this sense of gratitude guarded their hearts from even the bitterness of death. And I, I think about people today, they've, they've forgotten what the Lord their God has done. They look out and say, where are all the miracles? God has abandoned me. I'm in distress. You're in distress because God has not abandoned you. And your God has come to save you. Yeah. You know, a couple that uh, I, I, I love dearly that place membership today are the Kirshners, Michael and Sharon Kirshner. And in some ways, she is the female Gideon of our day. Sharon became a disciple in the 80s. In the 80s. And she became a disciple at a Little Campus Ministry in Missouri. And she was faithful to it for a couple of years. And then she became weary, lost heart, and fell away. Well, many years passed. She tries to find happiness in different places. But one of the good things that happened to her was marrying Michael. And so as, as they began to age and certain things came into their life, they began to seek God. And Michael was checking out all different things. And, and Sharon goes, oh, no, we better worship God with the right doctrine. So she takes him to one of the ICOC churches. And, and Michael studies, and he becomes a baptized disciple. Sharon gets restored, and, and, and it would seem to be happy, but when, when they were there... They, there was a lukewarmness. As a matter of fact, one particular Sunday, they preached some negative things against Portland. And that, that took Michael back a little bit. And he says, I'm going to check out why this place, Portland, is so persecuted and hated. And so he started getting on the Internet, and he ran all this and that. And pretty soon they went down to check out the new church down in Phoenix, and it eventually led them to visit Portland. And they go, wow, I see the miracles that everybody told me about. They happen with a church that has the favor of the Lord. Now we know that any baptized disciple that's driving is saved. That's not an issue. But we also need to know that God has commanded us to evangelize the world in the words of Lou Jack's song, in our day. Amen, guys? And if we're going to do that, it's going to be taking all the disciples that have a heart for God. And a heart to see things change come together. The Kirstners, they, they had a pretty cranking life in Minneapolis. Michael was one of the vice presidents of General Mills. That's, that's totally cranking, guys. As a matter of fact, about six months ago, the HR guy brought Michael on in. And he says, hey, we want to get the 10-year plan laid out for you. Michael goes, okay, bring it on. And I laid it out. And he said, over the next 10 years, you're going to be worth 40 to $50 million. And Michael's secret dream was also to be a president of General Mills. And he was well on his way to seeing it. But when they saw that that spiritual fellowship could not sustain him and they could not win as many souls as possible, 
We sat down with them and said, hey, it would really be awesome if you would join the mission team and be a part of the City of Angels Church. Now they wrestled with it. I mean, when you wrestle with four, 40 to $50 million, <laughs> and you know what they did? They said, we hear the Lord calling. In June, he resigns. They came on out here just a couple of weeks ago. He has no job. They live in a, a place that's a friend of theirs' apartment that has no furniture except a bed. But you know something? He told me the other day, we are happier than we've ever been. Because that... For a lot of people to say, oh my gosh, you sacrificed so much. No, no, no. That doesn't even come close for paying for the blood of Jesus. Are you with me right here? And so for them, all the stories of the miracles, they get to see it. They're seeing the baptisms again. They're seeing the restorations. They're seeing a great remnant being collected. And they paid the price. How much do you value finding a church where the Spirit of God is moving powerfully in the members' lives. They pay the price, and I believe God will give them great favor. Amen? Amen. The, challenge, the challenge today is simple. Number one, the favor of God, F. Number two, enjoy the odds, E. Number three, with idolatry comes spiritual amnesia, few. As the armor-bearer said to Jonathan, nothing can hinder the Lord from saving, whether by many or by few. Let us few rise up in this generation. Let us incur the favor of God and let us evangelize the world in our day. And God bless.